Dr. Hartley. Good morning, everyone. Um, the one good thing about being the first speaker is I'm the best talk so far. <laughs> I work for a UK charity organization called Theatre Versus Oppression. And the name of the organization is a little misleading. It gives the impression that we do theatre. And we do, but we do a lot of other things. And how we became, how I became involved with theater was actually by accident. I, to be honest, never wanted to act, never have. I didn't want to be on stage. But when I was studying my undergraduate degree, I also had to do a module in drama. And on this module, I had to study a particular play, which was Anton Chekhov's The Three Sisters. Not the most exciting play I've ever read. But this play, if you're not familiar with it, and if the title doesn't give it away, it's about three sisters. And when I read this play, it was very clear to me that one particular sister was the lead character. But then I went to see a production of it, and in this production, another sister was portrayed as the lead character. And I was quite confused, and I went home and I read the play again, and when I read it, I still felt that the character I had believed was the main character. And what I realized was that perception defines how we see reality. When I read the play, my own perceptions, my own life decided how I interpreted the play. And this began to change many things in my life because it created an interest in theater that had never existed before. But what it also did was create an interest about perception. What I realized was if we all have different perceptions, then we also have different truths. My truth is not yours. My truth can even seem like a lie to you. And the more I investigated this and applied it to theater work, the more I started to understand how problematic this could be. What I started to also question was memory. If our perceptions are all different, then how did I know that memory was truth? Memory is reflection. It's something that's achieved after time. It involves emotion and experience. And if that was the case, then we had no guarantee that memory was truth. It was our truth, but it was a created truth. It was what we began to see as a truth in a lie, or even a lie in a truth. And one of the, the scientific facts, I'm not sure how they got this, but they, they showed that every second our brain processes, well, our brain receives 400 billion pieces of information and is only able to process 2,000 of these. Think about that for a moment. Every second, 400 billion pieces of information and your brain can only process 2,000. Of course, we're not assimilating. Of course, we are all seeing and hearing different things. Everyone in this room thinks that we are looking at and hearing the same thing, but it's impossible, we're not. Added to this is the concept that sometimes our memory can be implanted. Um, I think we've all had the embarrassing experience where our parents tell us stories about when we were children, very embarrassing stories that we don't actually remember, 
but we hear them so often from our parents that eventually we start to think we do remember. And our brain starts to create the images to go with that memory. And suddenly it becomes a true memory for us. But it was implanted. We didn't actually remember that. Now, the theater work I then became involved with was to encompass all of these things. And what I wanted to look at was the fact that perception, what I wanted to acknowledge was that the limits of our perception is not limited to all that there is to perceive. And the theater is a wonderful way to explore this. Now, our theater work is based on looking at situations of oppression. And that means working with different groups that are usually issue-based groups. When I say issue-based groups, what I mean is we, we work with a range of groups. And this could involve um, alcohol and substance abuse. We work with sexual abuse. We work in prisons and hospitals. Um, we work with different programs around the world, sometimes refugee camps. But one of the, the first projects that we worked on was working with torture victims in South America. And this program, if we were going to work with projects based on perception, we had to put aside all our preconceptions. That's a very difficult thing to do. The nature of our work is three-pronged. We work with victims, perpetrators, and what we call bystander victims. Those are the families that might seem indirectly involved, but the direct effects lead to them often becoming victims or perpetrators later. And this meant that when we started the project working with torture victims, that we also had to work with the torturers and with families that were involved. It was never about right or wrong. It was not about judging if what someone had done was a good thing or a bad thing. It was about trying to understand the individual perceptions and truths that led to someone behaving and acting the way that they had. Now, our work is often um, typified by creating plays. Um, sometimes they're professional plays, sometimes they're for the group that we work with. And when we did the torture project, we created two plays. One was about the torture victim, and it was the first one. And the image you see behind me was the image we used to represent the play. We wanted to show that an image can create a perception on its own. And when we opened this play in South America, it was very clear to people that this was a play about a torture victim. And we then took the play on tour to the UK and to America. And what was amazing was that everyone who saw the play insisted it was about something else. People told us it was about rape, it was about sexual abuse, it was about government silencing people, all these different things that people applied to their own perception, their own reality. And one year after we had opened the play, we then opened the second play, which was telling the story of the torturers. Again, it wasn't about defending people. It wasn't about right or wrong. It was simply relaying the reasons they had given for their behavior. And before we even opened, there was an outcry. How could we possibly do this? How could we defend these people? They hadn't even seen the play yet. And when the play did open, this outcry continued in South America, like, how could we tell these stories? And in the middle of all of this, one group of people stood up and defended the play very publicly. And that group of people were the torture victims. 
And what they said was, people have to understand that the torture victim and the torturer is inside every one of us. And if we can't understand that and come to terms with it, then we will never be able to prevent these things from happening. It's about perception. Now, we currently have one project, a domestic violence project. Now, domestic violence is one of the reasons we took it on is because it affects people all over the world, whether it's America, the UK, or Africa. The stories were always the same. They were about the same kind of abuse, the same reactions, the same excuses. And we wanted to investigate this. And what was incredible was that in the UK, there are numerous fantastic organizations that are dealing with domestic violence, but they're dealing with the aftermath of domestic violence. They're dealing with the situation after it's happened. So they're, they're counseling people, they're getting people help to get out of their situation, counseling for families, medical help, psychological help. There's even a program for perpetrators to get them counseling help. To be eligible, you have to have been convicted. So in order to get the support and help, the violence has to have happened. Again, our work is not about right or wrong. It's about trying to understand the perceptions that created an event. If we can understand that, we can start to work with prevention. And that is ultimately where we come from. Our work is about empowerment, it's about support, but it's also about understanding the different perceptions that led to certain behavior. Now, talking about perceptions, I'd like you to look at the image behind me, and I'd like you to think about what you see there. What is it a picture of? Where was this picture taken? Now I'd like you to look at some slides that follow, and I'd like you to, to just think if it changes your preconceptions in any way. These pictures were taken in a refugee camp in Uganda where we work. We have a number of projects there. And there are many stories I could tell you about this. But the story related to these pictures is the most important. The first time I ever went to the refugee camp, after a few days, they said to me, can we ask you a very personal question? And I said, okay, ask. And they said, in your country, are you very, very poor? And I was a little shocked at the question. And I said, well, no, why would you ask me that? And they said, well, you wear refugee shoes. I was wearing Crocs. Perception. Now I have shown slides about the refugee camp all over the world. And everywhere I have shown these slides, at least one person will make one of the following two comments. They will say to me, they can't be that badly off, they have crocs. <laughs> or they say, oh, life in a refugee camp can't be so bad, they're smiling. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. Now, all of this might seem very obvious, nothing new. We all know that we have different perceptions and different truths. We know that, but knowing it does not breed understanding. When it comes down to it, we still think our truth is the only truth. We still are amazed that people don't understand things from our perspective, that they saw a situation differently. We're still incredibly judgmental based on what we believe to be our truths. There's a great danger in seeing the world only one way. And what we teach through a theater is how to perceive it in different ways, how to try to see that there are other truths. 
You don't have to accept them. You don't have to understand them, but you must accept that there are other truths. There are other perceptions. We are not seeing and hearing the same things. Now, in the refugee camp, the first year I went out there, we had a project where we worked with a group of men aged between 18 and 35. And there was one much older man in the group. He was maybe late 60s, early 70s. And one day, we were all sitting around talking, and I said to him, Elia, how old are you? And without a moment's hesitation, he said to me, I'm 52. And we all laughed, and we said, no, you cannot possibly be 52. And we started trying to calculate how old he was. And he stopped us, and he said, you don't understand. In my culture, when bad things happen to you, you must learn from them. You must grow from them, but never let them take a year of your life. Never give them credit for a year of your life. So the years of the war in my country, the years that I had to travel to the refugee camp, the years of famine when the crops failed, the years that I watched my family die before my eyes, I learned from them, I grew from them, but they did not take a year of my life. And so today, I would like to end on one question to all of you. How old would you be if you didn't know how old you actually were? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you. So I guess we don't have one TEDx Krungtep event today. We actually have about 250, right, if we're all perceiving them in different ways. Plus, with the lights on here, we're um, also being watched in other places. So I guess there's even more than in the room that we're, that we're having this <laughs> Krungtep event today. Thank you very much for our first speaker. Our next speaker.